Good morning, everyone. My name is Shiloh. My pronouns are he and him. And I'm the Affirming Ministries Coordinator of Edmonton, based on the Robertson Wesley United Church. Uh, today is the first of the 2021 Affirming Reflections live streams. Um, they've changed from weekly to monthly now. Um, so this is the first one that's happening in January. So our topic today is ending homophobia and transphobia. So today's uh, kind of live stream workshop is what I like to kind of envision this to be. Uh, we're going to start off with understanding what is homophobia, what is transphobia, um, why people are homophobic and transphobic, as well as some ways on which to, how to end um, homophobia and transphobia in our communities, in our families, in our groups, and hopefully throughout the world. So to start off, what is homophobia? So, people who identify as lesbian, gay, pan, or bisexual may experience harassment, discrimination um, from people who are scared or uncomfortable with these certain identities. So, a brief definition of what homophobia is, is we have the fear, hatred, discomfort with, or mistrust of people who are lesbian, gay, pansexual, or bisexual. This discrimination also extends towards folks who may be thought to be LGBT. Um, so this is people that may look like a certain stereotype or act a certain way, and people can be homophobic towards those people even though they do not identify as LGBT. We also have an additional word, uh, biphobia, that I won't be using that much throughout this um, workshop, I'll be using the term homophobia to, I guess, umbrella term it, um, but biphobia is a little bit separate. It is similar to homophobia. It's also the fear, hatred, discomfort, or mistrust, um, but this is specifically of people who are bisexual. Um, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is that we do have a lot of bi erasure within our community and within education, and so I wanted to share that there is a specific word um, for folks who um, are discriminated against uh, for being bisexual. We also have um, different forms of homophobia. So here we have things such as negative attitudes, negative beliefs about LGBTQ folks. Um, we have aversion to or prejudice against folks who are LGBTQ. We also have folks who use derogatory language um, or name calling when they are talking about LGBTQ uh, people. Even folks who are, are bisexual who experience biphobia um, get uh, certain things such as you're only bisexual for attention or that all bisexual people are cheaters. Um, we talked a little bit about that in my Myths of Bisexuality um, live stream a little while ago, so tune into some of the older videos to see a little bit more about that. In some cases, homophobia and biphobia can cause people to uh, bully, uh, abuse, and inflict violence on LGBTQ folks. And in most extreme forms, it could lead to even, even hate crimes or even murder um, of LGBTQ folks. And we see this a lot, uh, especially with trans folks. Um, that's why we have the Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is um, a really special time where we take uh, the time to remember those who have been murdered due to transphobia. We also have um, where homophobic and biphobic thoughts and beliefs and actions are often based on irrational fear, uh, ignorance, and also misunderstandings. And we'll talk a little bit about why people are homophobic um, as we keep going on. Homophobia and biphobia may stem from religious institutions, it may come from companies, governments, laws, policies, it can come from individuals like you and me. Uh, it may be as large as the culture itself being homophobic or biphobic, and as well as media. Media plays a huge role, especially now with the emergence of television and internet and computers. Um, we're seeing a lot of it going through that. Some examples include um, same-gendered couples not being allowed to marry in certain countries, um, getting legally fired just for being LGBTQ, um, not being able to have certain housing because of being LGBTQ, the lack of... Um, Healthcare for most cases, lack of representation uh, in media and in, in government, lack of legal protections from hate crimes. So these are all different real-life examples um, of what homophobia and biphobia looks like in our world. 
I talked a little bit about biphobia and homophobia, um, but similarly, there's also transphobia. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means um, as well. So I'm going to transition back here, and we're going to show you the definition. So transgender and gender nonconforming people may experience harassment or discrimination from people who are scared or uncomfortable with these identities. And as you see on the screen, the definition of transphobia is very similar um, to homophobia and biphobia where it's the fear, hatred, disbelief, or mistrust of people who are transgender, thought to be transgender, or whose gender expression doesn't conform to traditional gender roles within that um, society or culture. We also see that transphobia can prevent transgender and gender nonconforming people from living full lives free from harm and violence. And transphobia can take many different forms. And this includes, very similar to homophobia and biphobia, uh, negative attitudes and beliefs towards trans folks, aversion to and prejudice against transgender people, irrational fears and misunderstandings about our lives, disbelief or discounting preferred pronouns or gender identity or names, um, derogatory language or name calling towards LGBTQ, especially trans and non-gender non conforming folks. We also see um, different types of bullying, abuse, violence, and again, like the Transgender Day of Remembrance, even murder is a huge factor um, in the lives of LGBTQ folks, especially transgender folks, and even more, especially transgender women of color. Transphobia can create both a subtle and overt forms of discrimination. For example, people who are transgender or even thought to be transgender uh, may be denied jobs, housing, or health care just because they are transgender. And I've seen so many horror stories, especially within the healthcare system for trans folks, um, where they'll go in to see a doctor for some obscure um, uh, problem, like maybe uh, certain rashes or, or different diseases, um, and the doctors won't help them just because they are transgender, even though the reason why they went to see the doctor in the first place has nothing to do with their transition or their gender identity. So this moves us on to why, then, are people homophobic and transphobic? And I think this is a really important aspect to helping end homophobia and transphobia. Um, a lot of people just think people who are homophobic and transphobic are those overt people that are walking down the street and they say, you know, all of these rude things or harass people who are LGBTQ. But homophobia and transphobia can be a lot more subtle than that. And many of us, including myself, have been homophobic and transphobic in my lifetime. Um, and there are things that I still do that can be homophobic or transphobic. And many of you who are LGBTQ um, can also be homophobic and transphobic. Uh, it's not something that you have to be straight and cisgender to experience or to do. Um, you can be LGBTQ and experience these, both of them, or even and do it yourself. So that's why I think it's important to see why people are homophobic or transphobic, because I believe knowing why helps find the root cause of, of, of homophobia and transphobia. So although transphobia, biphobia, homophobia are all similar, they're all not the same thing. Both gay and straight people can be transphobic and biphobic, and people can be transphobic without even being homophobic and biphobic. So in general, when we are talking about homophobia and transphobia, we are seeing consistent patterns of people who um, are more... Uh, have negative attitudes against LGBTQ folks. So when compared to those who are fa have favorable attitudes, um, these are the, the consistent patterns that we've seen in people who are homophobic or who are transphobic. So the first one is people who are homophobic or transphobic are less likely to have had a personal contact or relationship with people who are LGBTQ. So these are people who have never met someone who is LGBTQ. These are people who may have met people who are, but didn't know that they are LGBTQ. Um, so this is just the, this idea that if you don't have a personal connection or relationship with anyone who is part of the community, um, it's more likely for you to be homophobic or transphobic. Number two is are less likely to report having engaged in homosexual behaviors or even to identify themselves as LGBTQ. So this we see that it is very less it is less likely to be homophobic or transphobic if you are LGBTQ yourself, but it doesn't exempt you from it. So people who are homophobic or transphobic are more likely not to be LGBTQ. 
Number three, are more likely to perceive their peers as manifesting negative attitudes, especially if their peers are males. Um, so people who have friends and family who are also perceiving um, or having negative attitudes towards LGBTQ people, uh, if you are in relationship with those folks, you are more likely to be homophobic and transphobic as well. Number four, uh, it depends on location. So here, they are more likely to have um, resided in areas with negative attitudes are the norm of LGBTQ folks. So this is usually in the States. It's the Midwestern and Southern United States. Here in Canada, these are places like the Canadian prairies or rural areas or small towns, um, especially if they lived in those spaces during adolescence. So um, as someone who's from Alberta and has lived in the Canadian prairies and has lived in a rural area as well and a small town, um, at once at one point in my life as a youth um, I can definitely uh, agree that folks who often live in these areas are more likely to be homophobic and transphobic it doesn't mean that everyone there is um, I know in the queer community there is a huge um, I guess pushback against folks who are very country um, or rural but we have seen especially here in Alberta a huge rise in uh, country rural LGBTQ folks um, especially with artists like Ray Spoon um, and many others who who are rural prairie folk uh, who are making changes in those in those communities as well number five we have people who are homophobic or more likely to be homophobic and transphobic are likely to be older um, and less well-educated. And I'll touch a little bit on this a little bit more as we talk about maybe the history of homophobia and transphobia. Um, and then you'll see why folks who may not have a lot of education or who may be older in age um, are more likely to experience these beliefs and attitudes. Number six, we have are more likely to be religious or to attend church frequently or to subscribe to a conservative religious ideology. Um, and we see this, I know I'm speaking on behalf of Robertson Wesley United Church. The United Church has been really um, affirming in their stance of LGBTQ folks for many years, but there are so many different Christian denominations, um, even the Catholic religion, um, many Christian uh, denom or Christian religions as well, uh, or even just religions that are very conservative, um, such as uh, certain uh, sects of Judaism, uh, Islam as well. Um, so there's many different religions that have a conservative view of LGBTQ folks, and so if they do come from that um, community, they are more likely to be homophobic or transphobic. Number seven, uh, people who are homophobic or transphobic are more likely to express traditional or restrictive attitudes about certain sex roles and even gender roles. And we see even that they are less permissive sexually or manifest more guilt or negativity about sexuality as a whole. Um, and so folks who have a very negative understanding of that, um, of sex and gender and sex roles and traditional roles um, are more likely to be homophobic because, or, and transphobic because folks who are LGBTQ often um, break free from those boxes that are placed. So I have another slide here. So these are kind of all of some of the reasons, I guess, <laughs> of why people are homophobic and or transphobic. Um, so I'm going to leave this slide up a little bit as I talk about some of the reasons why people are homophobic and transphobic. So touching on the top few points there, religion, uh, taught, belief, and ideology. So some people's homophobia and transphobia um, are sometimes rooted in conservative religious beliefs, often displayed by the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic religions. Religious beliefs reinforce a violent reaction against homosexuality and transgender identities. Um, and this is due to their strong hostility towards homosexual practices and gender nonconformity um, because this was historically linked with idolatry and heresy. And so for folks to jump in and, and start changing a lot of these um, beliefs and notions of what gender and sex is like um, are often seen as, you know, committing sins, going against God's will, um, causing heresy and idolatry for something else other than God's um, creation. And so this is why a lot of religious folks um, uphold a lot of uh, homophobic and transphobic beliefs. We also see additionally that some people may ho hold homophobic and transphobic beliefs if they were taught these beliefs by parents, families, friends, and communities. 
homophobia and transphobia are not something that comes inherently. Um, it is something that is taught. And usually folks who are homophobic or transphobic were taught to be homophobic and transphobic at a young age. And it's not until they get older that they start, you know, meeting people who are LGBTQ or learning more about these identities. And that's when their uh, homophobic and transphobic beliefs start to dwindle. We especially see uh, families who hold strict beliefs in traditional ideologies of family, sexuality, and gender roles um, to help uphold this homophobic and transphobic beliefs um, into their kids as well. And then the cycle persists where then they teach their kids and then their kids teach their kids. Uh, and it's an endless cycle of homophobia and transphobic beliefs um, within the family sect. And we also see that many people form their opinions and form their beliefs about homosexual um, and transgender people because of their lack of personal contact with them. So folks who don't know anyone who is LGBTQ um, are more likely to be um, homophobic and transphobic in their beliefs because they don't have anything to counteract those beliefs. In the middle section of your screen we see the words such as misinformation or stereotypes. Um, this area is where some people are homophobic and transphobic because they have, you know, misinformation of or no information at all about LGBTQ identities. And they may not be aware of LGBTQ people or any of the issues or even personally know anyone in their lives who are LGBTQ. And this lack of or misinformation is often a root cause for people to hold homophobic and transphobic beliefs. Additionally, we see a significant number of individuals who characterize LGBTQ people as mentally ill, as promiscuous, as, you know, lonely or insecure. People even believe that, homo or, uh, that uh, LGBTQ folks are likely to be child molesters or predators or very aggressive and hostile towards quote-unquote normal people or who are hostile towards folks who are heterosexual or cisgender. And even so, LGBTQ per persons who violate the stereotypical expectations of LGBTQ folks may actually be disliked as well. And so these are people who are very ga masculine gay men, or very feminine lesbians, um, or people who are trans who do not pass for their um, gender identity. Uh, these folks are not considered the stereotypical expectation of an LGBTQ person, um, even though there is no one type of LGBTQ person. Uh, it's very, very diverse in our community. Um, but those who do not fit those stereotypes uh, may actually be disliked more than those who fit stereotypes. In the bottom middle of your screen, we have words such as repulsion, um, conformity, threats, envy, or fear. Um, so these are more of the root causes that we see in mainstream media, um, and we'll see a little bit of why that is. So, in some studies back in the early uh, 20th century, we see folks such as William James, um, who assumed that being repulsed by the idea of intimate contact with a member of the same gender um, is, is, is instinctive. So they say that um, it is instinctive for people to not want to have sex with a person of the same gender, um, and he even goes further to say that this exists more strongly in men than in women in cultures where such forms of his, quote, unnatural vice as homosexuality and gender nonconformity are found. Um, and so he says that instinctual aversion can be overcome by habit. So he assumes that tolerance is learned, whereas revulsion is inborn rather than vice versa. And we see that that is uh, not the case. <laughs> we see that it is actually the opposite, where tolerance is often inherent, um, and is this revulsion or this repulsion um, of homosexuality or any sexuality that's not the heterosexual uh, norm to being bad. So his, his study showed the opposite, whereas now we've seen um, the changes in um, education and research and studies in the last 100 years, and we've seen that that is not the case and that it is actually vice versa. And welcome, RW. Nice to see you. We also have that sex differences in direction and it, uh, sex differences between folks actually has a um, 
consistent trend of the intensity of attitudes towards LGBTQ people. So this is uh, this appears that heterosexual folks tend to have more negative attitudes towards LGBTQ folks of their own gender than that of the opposite. So this is where we can see um, many folks who are trans or who are homophobic um, and identify as men. Um, oftentimes having no issues with lesbians. And we see that um, when we start talking about pornography um, or even talking about sex acts in general, um, a lot of men will say like, no, like two men doing it is not good, but if two women did it, that's okay. Um, so it's that kind of idea where it's their own gender that can't be LGBTQ, but if it's another gender, then that's okay. But we also have the opposite happening as well, where negative feelings towards opposite gendered uh, LGBTQ folks may result in a feeling of rejection as potential sexual partners. Um, so we see, again, we see this in mostly the male um, side of, of things where it's often heterosexual men that have this feeling of rejection. Um, if they see someone who is a lesbian, they, they feel like they're rejecting their own sexuality. They feel like they're being... Um, rejected as a man, as a sexual partner, um, and sometimes that's where negative feelings come from. So unfortunately we see two sides of, of the coin where, you know, if they're the opposite gender, it's it's bad because they're rejecting um, my sexual preferences. And then also the flip side is, you know, there's someone who's the same gender as me, um, but that's also not okay because it's only okay if other people do it. Um, and so we're seeing both sides of, of, of why people are homophobic or transphobic. We also see that it is frequently assumed that feelings of personal threat result in strong aversion to um, LGBTQ people. And so this is where this threat um, comes in, where, you know, people may be feeling... Um, that this person is threatening, you know, their beliefs, their ideologies, the way that they grew up, um, their own understanding of the world. Um, and so these very existential threats to their own identities um, often cause them to be very homophobic and transphobic towards others. And then we see that if there's a lack of threat, um, this actually leads to more neutral or positive attitudes towards LGBTQ people. And we also see that uh, attitudes are likely to serve as a defense function um, when an individual perceives that uh, being gay or lesbian or trans um, conflicts with their own unconscious understanding of themselves. And so here we see that these conflicts are, are specific to um, anti-homosexual or anti-transgender prejudice. And this is where... Um, these unconscious conflicts of one's own sexuality and one's own gender identity um, is then projected onto someone who is LGBTQ, and then those negative effects that the person feels for themselves is then also projected on to the LGBTQ person. So this is where uh, it allows people to permit their ex to externalize this in inner conflict of themselves and to reject their own unaccepted urges of being LGBTQ and rejecting it onto LGBTQ folks who are then a symbol to those urges um, without even actually maybe even consciously recognizing that these urges are actually their own. Um, and so this is where we get the stereotypical closeted bully trope. So many of you may be familiar with some movies, um, especially the first one that comes to mind is Glee or um, even Perks of Being a Wallflower. Um, we see that there's this character that is, you know, this stereotypical bully in school um, or just a complete asshat. <laughs> and they're wanting to, you know, be uh, really aggressive towards the openly gay characters on the show. And then it's not until later in the show or in the movie that we do see that this person who has been homophobic the whole time uh, is actually just gay and is closeted and is projecting their own internal hatred um, and internal homophobia onto others. And then it becomes uh, homophobia or transphobia um, externally. We also see that uh, some heterosexual or cisgender individuals may actually envy LGBTQ people. Um, this is weird to think about, but it's true. Some people may envy LGBTQ folks because um, they themselves are constrained by the gender and sexual ideals in their 
society and cultures, whereas LGBTQ folks are often seen as being able to, um, I guess, break out of those boxes and have more sexual and gender freedom um, that is then enjoyed by LGBTQ folks. And so some some folks may feel or be homophobic or transphobic um, because of their, their own understanding and their own, um, I guess, enviness of, of being constrained by by society. And Pan, uh, thank you for those examples. Yeah, sex education too. Um, I haven't seen that one, but yeah, it, there's many different examples of those of those bully tropes um, that we've seen, and I think those need to go away. <laughs> Personally, I feel like they're not helpful, but it is important to know that those tropes didn't come from nowhere, um, and that it is it is common for folks to be homophobic or transphobic if them themselves. Um, are experiencing those things themselves. And lastly, let's go back to our little slide here. Um, we sat, we have also here uh, experiences and location. Um, and so here we have where experiences and worldviews come into play of why people are homophobic and transphobic. So here we have attitudes develop when uh, specific interpersonal interactions are then generalized to all LGBTQ folks. So this is where if someone um, has had an unfortunate inter interaction with someone who is gay, for example, um, and then they project their hatred or their disgust um, for that person and exchange it to being an all-encompassing, every gay person is like that. Um, and likewise, even with trans folks, we see this a lot with the, the stereotype of the angry trans person. Um, I know many of you are probably very familiar with this idea of, of the very angry trans person, where, you know, if they get misgendered or um, if their name is not used or uh, anything like that, they'll explode and, and they'll share that they're displeased with it. And we see that this happens where a lot of folks experience... Um, those interactions with folks and then they think that all trans people are, are angry and ex explosive um, and vice versa like it, it could be an interaction that people have with others that have nothing to do with gender or sexuality and they still think that it is a characteristic of all LGBTQ folks um, which is obviously not the case and yes pan yeah uh, consequent fear of desiring to be like them. Exactly. It's that, that weird fear of being like, I want to have that freedom and I want to have that exploration of my own gender identity but I do, or sexuality, but I don't want to be included in that group. And it's that both end feeling there. So yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. We also see that a uh, person with, who had positive experiences um, with LGBTQ folks are actually more generally favor have favorable attitudes towards people who are LGBTQ because of that experience. And oftentimes face-to-face -face interactions, so being around someone and having those interactions with people actually refute stereotypes and reduce ignorance. So at the same time, people who um, have these interpersonal connections and encounters with people who are LGBTQ it creates an emotional impact on the person. And so having these emotional impacts actually increases um, likelihood to being more accepting of LGBTQ folks. Um, and not having those encounters or interpersonal connections has a higher chance of not having a favorable attitude and actually becoming more homophobic or transphobic. And so this is why I believe that having um, these stories, sharing our stories, being out and being open, um, like I do and like many others do, especially at Robertson Wesley and other congregations where we have, um, fo where we have folks um, who are out and able to share their own experiences and their own stories, that emotional encounter with people who are sharing their stories makes a huge difference in breaking down misinformation, breaking down beliefs, breaking down um, stereotypes that repulsion those fears that people may have. And so that's a long-winded <laughs> um, thought and understanding of what homophobia and transphobia looks like and why people are homophobic and transphobic. So now I'm going to briefly touch on a little bit of why, of the history of homophobia and transphobia in the past. Um, and, and this kind of comes into play of why people in certain locations 
um, may be more homophobic or transphobic, and it may also include a little bit of why people of different ages um, may also have different understandings of LGBTQ folks and different ranges of homophobia and transphobia within different generations as well. So we'll jump right into it. So LGBTQ uh, seniors today who were born, uh, who were actually born and grew up in a time where being LGBTQ was one, criminalized, and two, considered pathological. And so this means that throughout history and still even today, uh, being LGBTQ means that it can be a death sentence to folks. Many of you, especially young folks who are watching right now, um, you know, I, I am lucky enough, I have privilege to live in a world right now where I can be open, I can be out, I can share this information today here on Facebook, I can, you know, be featured in newspapers, I can be featured in, in different articles, and, and I would be celebrated for those identities. Whereas, not even, what, is, what would it be, 50 years ago, we have that in 1969, Canada finally decriminalized homosexuality. That means 50 years ago, you could have been jailed for being gay. That wasn't 100 years ago. That's not 1,000 years ago. That's not ancient history. That's our own generation. There are people alive today that could, go, have, could have gone to jail. For being gay. That's how recent this history is for people. And I want people to know that. Furthermore, even in 1973, just four years later, we finally had um, homosexuality removed from the DSM 4 or 5 at that time. Or it's the 5 now, but back then it was probably the number edition 1 or 2. Um, but they removed homosexuality as being a mental disorder. And that again was only less than 50 years ago. So due to homosexuality being illegal and being a mental disorder at a time, there was so much social stigma, outright violence, fear of death, threats of imprisonment, job loss, family rejection, and fear of being institutionalized. And this is why so many LGBTQ folks were forced to hide their identities for their own safety. And those who didn't were unfortunately killed imprisoned, had been rejected by family, forced into conversion therapy, and many other horrible things. LGBTQ folks were forced underground. This is where meeting people like oneself was kept secret. I myself had had many relationships where no one knew about because I couldn't tell anyone without fear of rejection and fear of um, job loss and and just fear of losing those relationships with my partners. This is where the creation of secret societies and clubs were created. This is where secret relationships and communities were a source of strength, strength and resilience for LGBTQ folks during these times, and even still to this day. We have our LGBTQ baby boomers um, from roughly 1946 to the 65, and we see our Gen Xers from 66 to 76, and these are considered the LGBTQ activist generations. So this is where um, several major events like the Stonewall Riots happened in 1969 in New York. This is where the bathhouse raids happened in 81 in both Toronto and in here in Edmonton. This is where the huge HIV and AIDS crisis happened in the 80s. Um, and these are all huge political turning points for LGBTQ equality and human rights here in North America. We even see a further increase of equality for human rights even since the 70s in Canada. We saw in 92 we had the removal of the military ban. In 05, we finally had the Civil Marriage Act. Um, I, th I think we were the fourth country in the world to allow gay marriage. Even in 2013, we finally got transgender rights. Yes, you heard me right. 2013. That was only eight years ago that trans folks finally had protected rights in Canada. And only it was in 19, or 2019, so two years ago, um, the World Health Organization finally, finally declared that being transgender also was not a mental disorder. So this isn't just a hundred or thousand years ago. This is in our past. This is our lifetime, you know? We were alive when a lot of these things were happening, and all, a lot of these changes were happening. And unfortunately, we still have so much more to go. So these are some of the reasons why people um, 
are homophobic and transphobic. It's surprising to see that, you know, uh, same-gender marriage had increased, and there's so much more acceptance um, of LGBTQ identities in all demographic groups across different generations, partisan lines, and religious faiths. And we're seeing a huge increase of, of acceptance and affirming um, ideologies and beliefs of LGBTQ folks. And this is why I think age and location really play a difference. We see that here in Canada, being gay is not illegal. Being gay is seen as celebrated. We have gay marriage. But if you go to another place in the world, you know, you, if you're LGBTQ, you could still be killed. You could still be imprisoned. Um, and so that's why I think it's important to understand where people are coming from and the knowledge that they have about LGBTQ folks as to why they're homophobic and transphobic. As I go on a little bit more, um, I also want to touch on internalized homophobia and transphobia. So folks who are LGBTQ who are watching right now, and if you'd like to share a little bit about your experiences um, with your own homophobia, internalized homophobia or transphobia, I'd love to read those comments today. Um, and feel free to write, um, don't share this uh, if you don't want me to, to say it out loud, but if you'd like people to read the comments later. So internalized homophobia, uh, it's essentially the same definition as homophobia, and same with internalized transphobia, but the difference is that it refers to people um, who are homophobic or transphobic towards themselves. Um, and so this makes sense of, of why we call it internalized transphobia or internalized homophobia. So it's where other people may or may not be okay to being LGBTQ, but it's this internalized discomfort with one's own identity as being transgender, gender nonconforming, or LGB, um, or pan as well, um, and just that own discomfort with that identity. Some people um, may have negative attitudes and beliefs about their own um, understandings of themselves because of their own desires. This may make them feel discomfortable. This may have their own disapproval based on the beliefs that they have. And they will never identify or accept their attraction or gender identity. And they will never identify as LGBTQ unless that internalized homophobia or transphobia is then changed. People dealing with internalized homophobia may need to feel like they need to prove that they are straight. Um, and this is where they may exhibit very stereotypical behavior of straight men or straight women, and even bully or discriminate against openly gay people. And likewise, on the flip side, we see that folks who are experiencing gender dysphoria or who have a different gender identity may feel the need to want to prove that they are cisgender um, and will exhibit very stereotypical gendered behavior based on the gender that they were assigned at birth. And furthermore, people who internalize um, homophobia and transphobia, they internalize these messages um, that they hear from others, that they may hear from their faith groups, that they may hear from um, friends and family. Um, and this is, adds to their own self, low self-esteem, it'll add to their self-doubt, and it'll add to their depression. And it becomes a cycle where they can't break out of it unless they are... Um, in relationship with folks who are LGBTQ or have strong allies um, with them to help educate them and, and to get them out of that internalized homophobic understanding. And many LGBTQ folks who experience internalized homophobia or transphobia share common experiences. And so I'm going to read out a few um, that I heard from some folks in the community, as well as my own experience with my own internalized homophobia and transphobia. So many folks feel like they were wearing blinders, uh, where they couldn't see their true selves over the negative attitudes and beliefs that were kind of shared upon them or forced upon them at a young age. Outdated gender roles played a huge part in why it was hard for them to figure out that they were LGBTQ. For many people, being LGBTQ was seen as a joke, so it was very hard to find people who were safe to come out to. Before the age of internet and global information, there was little to no uh, little to no knowledge um, or education about LGBTQ identities or experiences. Now we have books and websites and folks like myself who are doing live streams um, to help educate others. Knowledge around gender identity in itself has only increased in the last few years, um, whereas uh, LGB identities have been around and in the mainstream um, knowledge for a while now. And so this is why um, still many folks in the LGBTQ community may themselves still be transphobic um, because information about gender and, and uh, gender nonconforming, non-binary identities, trans identities um, are still 
starting to, to become more commonplace. Folks even said that because they lived in a cisgender heterosexual world, it was impossible for them to connect their identities with the experiences that they were having. Um, there was that disconnect there. Being LGBTQ was seen as bad, and so their thoughts and feelings of being LGBTQ that they were experiencing meant that those experiences were also bad, and so they tried to not have them. For folks who were a, uh, uh, asexual or aromantic, um, were forced into sexuality with family and friends, such as, you know, when are you getting married, like, you're forced to have kids, um, do you have a girlfriend-boyfriend type stuff. Um, and even now, with our with our societies and cultures being very sex-focused and sex-positive, um, many ace and arrow folks may be forced to, to have that as well. Even non-binary folks um, may feel like they couldn't really fully identify um, as non-binary because of those gendered boxes. And even the education around transgender identities was also very binary for the first um, little while. And even still now we see trans men, trans women, and very rarely do we talk about non-binary and gender non-conforming folks. And so because of that, um, that may internalize their own um, transphobia as well. Other things such as internalized misogyny and sexism also plays a huge role in why people internalize their LGBTQ identities. And lastly, um, many folks internalize their identities um, because of their faith, and vice versa. Many people internalize their own faith because of their identities. Um, being Christian and being LGBTQ is very hard to um, navigate when you're in those in-between spaces because the LGBTQ community is very hostile towards religion, which is rightfully so, um, and then vice versa, the religion is very hostile towards LGBTQ folks, and so having both those identities, it often makes folks feel like they need to choose one or the other, um, because being both in one of those categories often results in um, some sort of um, dissatisfaction with, with who they are, and so many folks internalize either or their faith or their identity in order to, to live safely in the world. And so... Next is, um, how, how does this affect the LGBTQ community? So for many of you, um, I know myself, it's, it, LGBTQ folks have a huge risk of mental health issues. And this could be anything as, you know, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, uh, the substance abuse, suicidal thoughts and suicide, gender dysphoria. Um, these are all, um different effects that the LGBTQ community has because of homophobia and transphobia in our world. This increased risk for various mental health conditions uh, in the queer community is usually, is often always a result of discrimination, marginalization, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, um, vulnerability, uh, bullying, stigma, violence, um, loss of support, rejection by friends and family. So all of these are very real experiences of LGBTQ folks, and because of that, um, there is increased risk for mental health. And so ending homophobia and transphobia in our society and in our culture will help increase the mental health, um, the health of, of, of folks' mental health in general. And so I think it's really important to know that the mental health effects in the queer community is a direct result of the homophobia and transphobia in our community. And so those two things are very, very connected. And so I'm going to touch a little bit on how how we are to end homophobia and transphobia, how to get support if you are experiencing homophobia and transphobia, and we're going to end off on a um, paper activity. So as I continue going, um, these are some of the things that you'll need to grab. If you don't have them with you already, um, feel free to run and grab them right now. Uh, you can, there's uh, the pen, paper, tongs or tweezers, water, lighter, and a match. So what we're the idea of what we're going to do is we're going to write down something on a piece of paper, and using the tongs and lighter, we're going to burn it, and having water on the side, <laughs> just as a safety measure, you can either have it in a bowl or a cup. Um, and yeah, so please go grab those those tools and come right back and we're going to end off on that activity. So how to end homophobia and transphobia. So I'm going to just go through the list of things. If you have any other thoughts or reasonings um, on how to end homophobia and transphobia, please feel free to share those in the comments below. So, first, 
don't ever use negative or offensive language to describe LGBTQ folks. That's one of the parts of homophobia and transphobia is using negative language um, towards people in the community. And so not using that language um, is a great way of being an ally and to reducing homophobia and transphobia. Being careful of how we use casual language, so not saying things like, that's so gay, asking personal questions about transgender people's genitalia, surgery, or sex life, um, avoiding giving trans people compliments that are actually insults, um, such as, like, you look like a real girl, or I never would have guessed you were transgender. Um, another way of, of helping end homophobia and transphobia could be, you know, dot, not believing in certain stereotypes about LGBTQ folks, not making assumptions about them either, being a vocal supporter of the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community, um, regardless of your own sexual orientation or gender identity. This is also just known as being an ally. Letting the LGBTQ folks in your life know that you are a friend and an ally. Educating yourself on LGBTQ issues. Um, Respecting LGBTQ folks' decisions on whether or when they want to come out. Using people's preferred pronouns and names, and if not knowing, asking them what they are. Joining your school's Gay Straight Alliance or Queer Straight Alliance, um, or starting one if your school doesn't have one. Remember that being LGBTQ is just one part of a person's very complex identity in life. Um, being LGBTQ is not the only thing that's a part of us. You know, we have... Um, other characteristics, you know, I have other things that I enjoy in my life that are a part of me that um, that my transness doesn't overshadow. Showing interest in your LGBTQ friends, partners, um, just as you would if your straight friends, partners. Using gender neutral language such as they and them, folks and people instead of he, she, girls and boys, gentlemen and ladies. Respecting trans people's pronouns. You know, feeling safe when doing so, speaking up against folks who are, you know, acting or being homophobic or biphobic or transphobic. Um, telling them that their offensive jokes or negative language or bullying and harassment is not something that is okay. Um, and stepping up and, and ending those conversations. Being an advocate within your religious or spiritual community um, for more acceptance, love, and support for LGBTQ folks. And when you are addressing homophobia and transphobia within others, um, make sure that you keep these things in mind. Deciding that if it's safe to address these issues um, is the first and, and main thing that you need to know. Is it safe for me to call out or call in these folks? So some things to consider. Will you be confronting the stranger in public? So this is calling out. Um, this is where you, you know, you straight up say like, oh, hey, like, I don't like that certain language. I don't want you to say that stuff around me. Um, oh, hey, that language is actually not uh, appropriate. This is the language that they are using now. Um, you know, being like, hey, I don't like that type of, 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 of words. Please don't use that around me. So those are calling out things that you can do. Or you can even call them in. So this is where you talk to friends, family members in private. Um, this is when you, you know, instead of speaking up now, you save it for later and you talk to them at a later time. And so this is kind of the idea of, of figuring out if you should call out or call in and deciding if it's safe for yourself as well as for others. You know, if others are with you, um, who are being, uh, harassed, is it safe for them for you to call out, um, this person? Is it safe for yourself? Um, so making sure that you keep those things in mind. And lastly, I do want to say for all the allies watching, um, it's okay if you mess up. <laughs> it's totally okay if you mess up a person's pronouns, if you mess up their names, um, if you mess up, you know, because we all mess up. I mess up, you mess up. The only thing is making sure that if you're doing it, that if you do mess up, to apologize and to make the change. If you keep messing up over and over and over again without actively trying to change it, it then becomes an issue. If you accidentally do it, it's not the end of the world. Make your apology, make the change, and do the change. If you're intentionally trying to name someone with their old name or intentionally using pronouns that a person doesn't use, that's when it's homophobia and transphobia. If you accidentally mess up, it doesn't make you homophobic or transphobic. It means you messed up, and it's just a little bit more work that you have to do on your end. If you are LGBTQ and you're watching, and you are experiencing homophobia and transphobia, this is how you can get some support. The first thing is 
locate and be in community with other LGBTQ folks. If you are experiencing homophobia, transphobia, reach out, talk to someone. Um, if whether that's myself, whether that's someone else in your in your community that's LGBTQ, have someone in your life that you can talk to and express everything that you are feeling. Your local LGBTQ community center or programs is a great way to find communities and to find supports. This can be things like the youth group in St. Albert called Out Loud. Um, I also uh, help run my own program called Soul Outing at Robertson Wesley. There's even the Pride Center uh, in downtown by McEwen University. We also have the ISMA Center, uh, which is located at the U of A. We also have the Landing, which is also located at the U of A. So there's many different local LGBTQ community centers and programs um, that folks can, can join and find community and support. In. There's also online communities as well for LGBTQ folks. Um, so there's online communities such as pages like my Affirming Ministries page. There's other pages that Isthmus and Pride Center also have. There's also groups such as Haven and Soul Outing that have online communities that you can join. And there's even other LGBTQ groups that are not religious at all, which are, you know, Queer Yeg or LGBTQ folks of Edmonton. Um, if you Google any of those groups, you can find them as well, and they are locally run. And Pan says, got all the stuff, excited to burn. Awesome. I'm, I'm excited for you, too. We also have uh, the internet, which is a super, super useful thing in finding communities and supports and in dealing with homophobia and transphobia and any type of discrimination. There's many online forums that you can join. Um, you can find um, other folks, such as family members or teachers or any other LGBTQ trusted adults that you can talk to. Um, you can even talk to allies if, if that's your only um, possibility. Joining a gay straight or queer straight alliance. Um, the main thing is if, if, if you don't seek help um, and just accept the homophobia and transphobia that you're experiencing, um, the harassment will probably always continue. Um, and it may also even get worse over time. And so it's very important if you are experiencing these things to please talk to someone and share your experiences. Because um, if we just keep letting it happen, it'll continue happening. So we need to end it by being aggressive to fight against it, showing our love, showing our acceptance, and showing our pride. And so for folks who were able to grab all of the, the supplies, again, run and grab any of these, uh, or any variation of these. Um, anything really works with you. Um, I have my paper, my pen, I also have my lighter and water. Um, so I'm going to do that myself. So what we're going to do right now to end off our workshop today is if you are LGBTQ and if you, if you experience any homophobia, transphobia, either external or internalized, I want you to take this time to find your piece of paper and to write down... Um, some of the things that homophobia and transphobia made you feel. You know, this could mean um, feeling small, feeling isolated, feeling bad, feeling sinful, feeling um, negative about your own self, uh, self-hatred. Uh, any of the feelings that this gives you, or that it makes you feel, or that maybe even things that you want to write down of how homophobia and transphobia made you view yourself as being a bad person, or um, being, you know, promiscuous, or being, you know, again, these are all very internalized. Um, and so for, for folks who are LGBTQ, think of the things that, that homophobia and transphobia made you feel and write them down. Folks who are not LGBTQ, uh, and for folks who are allies, if you want to participate in this as well, maybe think of the times where you may have accidentally been homophobic or transphobic. Maybe think of the times where you messed up. Maybe think of the beliefs that homophobia and transphobia made you think of, especially for folks who, who may have experienced homophobia and transphobia um, by folks as well. Maybe you've experienced these too. So I want you to write down all of the lies, all of the falsehoods that homophobia and transphobia make you believe about yourself. And write them down.
when you are ready. Um, feel free to take longer. You don't have to, to do this exactly at my time. But um, take down all of those words that homophobia and transphobia made you feel, made you believe, made you understand about yourself. And I want you to take that piece of paper and to fold it up. And we're going to burn it. Because everyone loves burning things. <laughs> and the reason why we're going to burn it is because all of those words, all of those beliefs that you have about yourself, all of those attitudes that people have towards you, I want you to know that they're all lies. And that when we burn these, we're burning the effect that homophobia and transphobia has on our own identities, on our own characters, on our own lives, and our own experiences. And we're saying today that no more. There's no place for homophobia and transphobia in our world. There's no place for it in our churches. There's no places for it in our friend groups or our families. And that when we burn this piece of paper today, we are burning the chains that harassment and discrimination and words have on us. Because we are better than this. We are stronger than this. You are loved. You are important. You are not less than. You are exactly who you need to be. And I am proud of you, and I know many others are proud of you. And I want you to think of all of the great things that people think about you and replace all of the bad words that they have. So we're going to burn this together here. Let's see if I can get it nice in the view. We're going to burn it all because homophobia and transphobia do not belong. So thank you all for joining me today. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen and learn with me um, and engage in the topic of transphobia and homophobia. I really hope that uh, you learned a thing or two today uh, of what it means, how it's been, why people are, and I really hope the activity at the end really makes you feel like you're important, because you are. You know, all of the, the feelings that homophobia and transphobia have given me over the years, the amount of therapy I've needed because of it, um, I think it's important to realize that these things do not define us, and we are not the people that the lies have told us we are, and that we are important, that we are, um, you know, supposed to be ourselves, supposed to be everything that we need to be. And I really hope that this is a way of, of helping you to be more accepting, because the more people that feel accepted, the more people that come out, the more education that shows, the less ignorance there is, and the less homophobia and transphobia we have. And so if we work together to stop people from sharing homophobic and transphobic stuff, if we continue to educate others, if we continue to show our pride, a lot of this will eventually hopefully end for our children, um, for generations to come, and hopefully it'll get to the point where um, we don't even have to live in a world where coming out is a thing and that everyone is just accepted for who they are. And I really hope that I get to live at a time where that is the case, and I hope you do too. And it's all something that we have to work together to strive for. So thank you so much uh, for joining me for Affirming Reflections. Again, we'll meet on the third, sun, or third Monday at noon. So the next Affirming Reflections will be on February 15th. So tune in for that. Um, if you are available at all during uh, the week, I do have my Affirming Ministries um, Affirming Coffee Hour on Thursdays at 11 a.m. And so this is... Uh, a drop-in time for folks to join from 11 to 12. It's just a place to, to hang out, ask questions, um, find other folks that are LGBTQ, and just a, a safe place to kind of talk about and be um, yourself. And if you have any other further questions or concerns or want to chat with me, feel free to message me on Facebook, send me an email, book a time slot with me, and we can do a Zoom call. Um, I'm here for your support. If you need anything, please reach out. Um, especially if you're experiencing homophobia and transphobia within your lives. So thank you so much. Tune in next time and have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.